morning, everyone. My name is Farzad Nader, and uh, I am one of the members of Vancouver CIM branch technical committee. I would like to welcome you to our first 2021 webinar, which will be presented by Gord Durskan, president of JDS Engineering Division, which will I introduce later. Let's uh, let's start with the safety share. And the safety share is about a tunnel um, in our region. The pioneering design and construction of the tunnel between Coquitlam and Manzan Lake Reservoir allowed the region to begin to convert from fossil fuel generation to clean and plentiful hydropower in early 900s. In the early 900s, safety regulations were not in place and working conditions were very dangerous. As a result, between 1903 to 1912, around 100 workers lost their life during the construction of this tunnel. The condition has improved significantly since then, but we are not there yet. We still see people lose their lives during construction and even operation of various mines and facilities underground or above ground around the globe. It is everyone's responsibility in the industry to consider safety as one of the most important element of our lives at work, at home, and in between. Uh, I guess this is the, the after the safety share. Uh, let's go to some of the, the housekeeping. Uh, if you haven't renewed your CIM national and, and CIM Vancouver branch, you can do it at the same time. Maybe this is a good time to do that. Uh, please go ahead. If you want to stay connected and, and, and looking for what is going on with Vancouver branch, uh, please check out our LinkedIn page. Uh, you can keep track of industry news, CIM events, and even employment opportunities for uh, some of the students. You can find everything in our LinkedIn page. At this point, I would like to thank some of our um, featured um, sponsored Bedrock Services, our gold level sponsor, thank you. AMC Consultants, other gold level sponsor, thank you. Merit Consultant International is another silver sponsor for CIM branch. Uh, Pan American Silver is another silver sponsor. And also SLA, thanks for sponsoring CIM, um, CIM branch, uh, Vancouver branch. We also, one more, uh, Solveig, we also want to thank you, our bronze sponsor, uh, for sponsoring Vancouver CIM branch. At this point, I would like to introduce Gord. Um, Gord is the president of JDS Engineering Division. He has started his career in 1984 as a field assistant on um, regional exploration program in Northwest Territories. He graduated from BCIT in 1985 with a diploma of technology in mining and, and right after graduation, headed north to Yellowknife to work as an underground surveyor for the giant mine. He progressed to general foreman of construction and operation of tailing treatment plants. After leaving Yellowknife, he went back to school at Montana Tech and obtained mining engineering degree. After graduation, he traveled to Timmins when he worked as underground mine planning engineer at Pamor Mine. He moved then to Wyoming, where he worked as underground planning engineer at FMC Strona Mine, and later he worked as chief engineer at the nearby Thermal Coal Mine. Gore left Wyoming in 1995 and moved to Zambia in Africa as part of a group sponsored by the World Bank to help Zambia consolidate copper mines to optimize and improve operations. After six years, of working in Zambia, Gore returned to Canada in 2002 and moved to the Sunshine Coast, where, where, he, managed, he, where he managed the largest natural sand and gravel operation in Canada. In 2006, he joined SRK as a principal engineer and mining practice leader and led the various engineering studies and due diligence reviews through, throughout the globe. In 2012, he became the vice president of engineering at JDS Energy and Mining, and now he's the president of JDS um, Engineering Division. 
He's a professional engineer in Yukon and BC, and he became CIA member in 1984, which is very impressive. When he's not the president of JDS um, Engineering Division, he's an, an avid runner, a gardener, a lumber miller, a, a motorcyclist, and a grandfather. Lord, please have the floor. Great, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, for those of you looking at your screen, uh, I'm not George Darling. We had a mix up in the name somehow on the invitations anyway. So I'm really happy to be uh, presenting today. I thank you very much for the invitation to be doing this. And I'd also especially like to thank the sponsors um, again for their um, contribution to the local branch. So my talk today is on Lucera Diamond's Karoi project in uh, Botswana. I'm going to give a very brief company overview and then get into some details of the underground planning. It's a bit of a unique deposit and I think you'll find it interesting, um, especially the underground mine planning engineers out there on some of the solutions that we've chosen and the direction that we've taken. So uh, I've got about 40 slides that I'll roll through fairly quickly and hopefully there'll be enough time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, the uh, Crowe mine is located uh, in Botswana, which is a landlocked country in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. It's on the eastern edge of the Kalahari Desert, very dry climate. It's about six hours from Habaroni, which is the capital of Botswana, which is in the southern part of Botswana, and about 10 hours drive from Johannesburg. The uh, kimberlite uh, pipe that is being mined at Crowe is within the Arapa kimberlite field. Uh, there are four other deposits that are or in the past were commercially mined in the local area. And it's about 20 kilometers away from Debswana's uh, Arapa mine, which is a very large uh, uh, open pit mine. The picture at the bottom left hand side and on this screen is of the facility itself. So you can see the open pit in the middle, waste rock dumps on the left hand side. Uh, processing plant on the right-hand side and uh, fine uh, reject facility at the bottom. The company was founded in 2007 by Lucas Lundin, Ira Thomas, and Catherine um, Cloud Setzer. Uh, they purchased the AK-6 deposit from African Diamonds in 2010 and, and immediately uh, began construction. At the time of the purchase, they the impact and the presence of large diamonds was not really understood. And this whole theme on large diamonds is really gonna play into this presentation. Um, they commissioned the processing plant uh, in 2012. And then because of the presence of larger diamonds, they went with an XRT technology machine that uh, helped sort um, the diamonds. So rather than rely on dense media separation, they went with a machine that was more selective. Um, in 2018, more recently, they acquired a Clara Diamond Solution Company, which is really a, an online uh, platform, a uh, digital platform for the sale of diamonds, which is very unique in the industry. Um, in 2019, uh, we conducted the feasibility study. And in 2020, uh, when COVID was um, kind of at its height, uh, uh, did all the detailed engineering with uh, sub-consultants, principally UMS uh, out of South Africa for shaft design. In 2021, just recently, they announced, the Lucera announced the closure of their financing of uh, 170 million US plus another 50 million in revolving uh, line of credit. Uh, in addition to that financing, they'll be putting money from their operating income from the current uh, operation. And the infrastructure, construction, and precinct have begun on site. Um, so the underground uh, development is just beginning uh, underneath the currently being mined open pit. Next slide. In the operating history, uh, Lucera has covered, uh, recovered uh, some of the largest uh, gem quality diamonds uh, ever found in the world. Um, it's got a very high operating margin, uh, low cost operation, 
And um, due to the value of the large diamonds, um, it, it makes it uh, a profitable business. There's been over 2 million carats sold so far in the life of the mine. This is important because it gives really good accuracy in terms of um, size distribution curves in anticipation of uh, what's to come. So those are very well known. Uh, it's produced uh, almost 2 billion in, in revenue. The original capital investment was 200 million. Some of the exceptional stones that have been recovered from the Kuroi mine, um, there's been 6,700 plus 10.8 carat diamonds found. These are called specials. So when you hear me refer to specials, that anything above 10.8 carats. There's been 24 um, greater than 300 carat diamonds found and three greater than 1,000 carat diamonds found. Four of the uh, world's five largest diamonds have come from the Crowey mine. The size of the diamonds is important because most of the revenue from the mine comes from the larger diamonds. So specials contribute to 70% of the revenue, although they only account for 5% of the diamond mass. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the MPKS and EMPKS, which are just two types of uh, deposits in which the diamonds are found. In the last quarter, so you know, what have they done for me lately? Um, the recovery of coarse diamonds has gone up significantly. And um, really the second bullet is the most important there. So 10.2 weight percent of the total uh, diamonds recovered um, are the, uh, the, the coarse diamonds, the, the specials and above. This is really, really important because they attract a significantly higher value. So in the past quarter, uh, 261 specials have been found, and then you can read the rest of them, the two between 100 and 200, and one diamond of uh, almost 1,200 carats was, uh, was found last quarter. They also have been finding pink diamonds, which they haven't traditionally found many of in the past, and that's a, a, also a, a benefit that uh, we'll see if that continues or not. Next slide. All right, the underground project itself. Next slide. So the project description, the capacity of the, the processing plant right now is 2.6 million tons a year. So that's the target for the underground mine to carry on from the open pit. The life of the underground is 13 years with about a five and a half year pre-production construction period. There's approximately 34 million tons of uh, reserve underground, and that increases the total reserve to about 56 million. The, there's about 5.1 million carats underground at a grade of 15 carats per 100 tons. The, uh, the mine extends below the bottom of the pit, which is, is roughly 300 meters deep, will be 300 meters deep, down to uh, 700 meters deep. Next slide. This is the shape of the deposit. There's actually three pipes um, related to this deposit. Uh, the blue and the kind of pinky orange ones there are the north and central lobes. Those are being mined with the open pit, but will not be mined underground. Um, the large carrot shaped one, the blue and, and purple and green one is the uh, the south lobe, and that's the subject of the underground mining. There's two main uh, kimberlite types in that pipe, uh, the MPKS and the EMPKS. The EMPKS is prevalent at the bottom. The EMPKS contains uh, coarser diamonds and higher value diamonds and higher grade than the MPKS. Next slide. This is a mineral resource estimate. Um, so you know, roughly uh, 56 uh, million tons um, of total indicated and inferred. The indicated is 50 million tons at a grade of about 15 uh, carats per 100 tons. You see the bulk of it is in the south lobe, MPKS and EMPKS. Next slide. So the mining method selection, um, a, a 
a key component, obviously, of, of any mine, and particularly so for the Kuroi mine, uh, because of the unique characteristics of the deposit. And the process is really driven uh, by the data that was acquired during the feasibility study and prior to the start of it, and really guided by risks, practicality, and economics. So it's um, we really looked at, uh, uh, took a holistic view of the what the mining method should look like and how it would work. Next slide. So the goal was really to maximize value of the of the project. Uh, if you can go back one slide. Um, it wasn't to maximize extraction. It wasn't to maximize mine life. It wasn't to minimize costs. It wasn't to maximize production or eliminate risk completely. It was really to find out the best fit for the project. What was a constraint was feeding the mill at 2.6 million tons a year. That was an important element to it. But other than that, it was fairly wide open as to how we approach this. Next slide. On the data collection side, there was a considerable, in fact, the most amount of data I've, I've ever seen in my career from a geotechnical and hydrogeological point of view. Uh, we drilled over 22,000 um, meters of, of uh, core um, in 35 geotechnical drill holes. There was an extensive uh, field program in terms of uh, testing, lab testing and on-site testing of, of material. So very large database of all different uh, geomechanical properties and extensive hydrogeological testing um, to really give us the, the basis to start our uh, mine planning and uh, mining method selection process. In addition to that, we have the operating open pit, which obviously the walls reveal some of the upper lithologies and, um, and the, and the um, uh, the water bearing zones. Next slide. Uh, in addition to the geotech and hydro, we did, uh, we took samples for the XRT machines. It was important to us to understand what dilution could, what role dilution would play in the performance of the XRT machines, because there's a particular um, host rock lithology that is a carbonaceous shale that actually contains uh, you know, small little veinlets of coal. We were concerned that that coal might um, send uh, artificial uh, readings to the XRT machine and get kicked out as, as uh, diamonds because of the carbon content of the coal. Um, when we ran tests, we found that wasn't the case luckily and that the XRT machines actually were able to separate the uh, diamond from the carbonaceous material. Next slide. So the deposit context, really what we started with on the mine design was the geometry. The open pit is 300 meters deep and the resource goes down to greater than 800 meters depth. It's vertical and it's a carrot shaped pipe that's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. From a geotechnical point of view, the kimberlite is extremely competent and strong. It's, it's in the nature of a granite, of a very competent granite. So it's unlike um, almost any other kimberlite uh, in the world. Certainly very different than the South African uh, kimberlites. The host rock is variably weak and strong. Um, the layers from top to bottom are calcrete, basalt, sandstone, mudstone, carbonaceous shale, and granite. The granite composes about uh, half of the, uh, half to a third of the um, the host rock of the pipe that's going to be mined from the underground. And that's an important consideration because the, the granite is strong and will um, prevent a lot of uh, dilution. Hydrogeology, there are some prevalent regional water bearing zones and various aquitards and aquacludes that have to be uh, dealt with in the mine plan. And the rock value is significantly higher uh, per ton at depth than it is at the top of the underground deposit. So this, is a, this was a key factor in deciding how we would approach this. Next slide. You can see the number of carats um, for each 25 meter interval. And more importantly here is the distribution of MPKS, if 
which is, as I've said, is the lower value uh, material compared to the EMPKS. So as we go deeper, the EMPKS is much more prevalent uh, in, in the pipe and carries much more value. Next slide. This is a, uh, a depiction of the rock value according to depth. This is um, showing you the, all of the material below the pit and roughly the value of the rock towards the top of the underground is $80 a ton and the value uh, towards the bottom is about 135. So pretty significant difference in, in value uh, top to bottom. Next slide. The rock lithologies, I ran through those quickly. I won't spend too much time on them, but they're varying in terms of strengths, uh, starting in the top with a calcrete, which is quite competent, a weathered basalt, which is a little bit broken up, but is also uh, very manageable, down to a fresh basalt, which is extremely uh, competent and tough rock. Then a tanny sandstone is, um, uh, again, fairly good material. And this is the depth of the pit currently is kind of in the middle of the Natani sandstone. Below in the Natani is a, a weaker, a slightly weaker sandstone. And then we get into some mudstones and carbonaceous shales, which lie above uh, the basement uh, granite rock. Some of these zones, um, mudstone is, is fairly competent. The carbonaceous shale is quite variable in terms of competency. Some of these zones uh, deteriorate quite quickly with exposure to uh, moisture or just the atmosphere. Uh, just one last slide on the strength of the, the kimberlite. Uh, you can see the crowy deposit in the middle, the tensile strength in terms of an MPA strength is over seven, which is uh, unlike uh, pretty much any other kimberlite seen in the, in the world that I'm aware of. So I've talked a little bit about the geotechnical considerations of the, of the rock. You can see what the, this is a cross-section view showing the lithologies and showing uh, what would be left after the open pit um, has been mined. So the, the MPK and the EMPK and a little bit of the KIM-3 are what would be mined from the underground, you can see there. So uh, next slide, I've talked pretty much about this. Just to give you an idea of the size of the kimberlite. So there's the Vancouver Convention Center, the uh, grass roof, which probably most of you have seen at some point. Um, so the top of the underground section of the kimberlite pipe is roughly the size of that roof. And the bottom of that pipe is, uh, the bottom of the kimberlite pipe at the 300 uh, meter elevation level is, uh, is about uh, 50 to 75 meters uh, in diameter, smaller than that. So when we started looking at options for mining methods, the first one that comes to mind, um, well, there's two that really come to mind that are more conventional. First one would be block caving. Um, doing our geotechnical investigations and due to the size of the pipe, uh, the, we know that the rock mass will not cave naturally. Um, we did uh, some overcoring work to uh, determine the in situ stress. Uh, the horizontal stress is, is, is low. And even block caving with preconditioning, um, hydrofracking from surface, that type of thing, uh, we don't think will work because the lack of uh, horizontal um, stress and horizontal fractures in order to propagate that. It's very, very uh, tough, this rock. It comes out as uh, full lengths of core um, with uh, almost no, no breaks at all. So the first method that we thought might be suitable, the block caving really wasn't an option. So sublevel caving uh, was the next logical one. Uh, and when we started to look at that, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, from a timing point of view, it's the minimal amount of capital to put into it because it's a top-down method where we would go in and, and develop below the pit. And then when the pit finishes, uh, be able to start um, doing the, the sub-level cave or sub-level retreat. There were some issues with it though. And the predominant issue with doing a sub-level cave in this particular pipe was because of the uh, the value of the, the ore at the top. So we know that the value is considerably less than at the bottom. And uh, there were some other issues that we had due to some of the weak lithologies of the host rock, 
some of the zones like the carbonaceous shale, I mentioned some of the weaker sandstones, as well as some of the, um, the, uh, the groundwater uh, prevalence in the area, we're concerned that the development rate and development cost of a ramp or access for a sublevel cave would be uh, problematic. And um, as a result of that, when we did the analysis, um, it really pointed to needing to get to the bottom of the, of the deposit uh, first in order to get the best return. Sublevel cave um, also you know, can have a higher dilution than the method we proposed. Um, and the other thing about it, because it's a carrot shape, you, you lose the production capacity as you go down, um, hauling or uh, conveying uh, from depth uh, becomes more, uh, just longer. And uh, the amount of um, stoping area you have decreases uh, over time as you get deeper. So we thought there was a high potential to actually slow down production in the bottom third of the mine which was not a, uh, an ideal uh, situation. So what we came up with was a method that was used at the Goldex mine um, in Quebec. And it really a long hole shrinkage and it's a bit of a misnomer. You, you could think of it as fully assisted caving, I suppose. And the, the method idea is, is a bottom up sequence, um, really developed like a block cave. So the full extraction drive with uh, draw points, undercut, all of that setup is done like a block cave. The difference is, is that all of the material is blasted. So our design uh, has intervals of sublevel intervals spaced at about 100 meters apart, uh, drilling with ITH uh, drills to break the material up in a bottom up fashion. So um, working on top of the stope and blasting from the bottom up until the deposit is fully blasted. And then it's just uh, simply drawing muck out of the bottom. I'll show some detail of that uh, in a minute here. Next slide. So the benefit of this long hole shrinkage or fully assisted caving um, is that obviously we could get the highest value material first. That increased the revenue of about 150 million tons a year in the early years. Um, additional dilution was delayed until late in the mine because we were starting mining against the, um, the, the granite host rock, which is uh, very competent. We, um, the underground can be fully developed uh, with the pit operation still working. So unlike in a uh, sublevel cave where we would be really having to wrap up the open pit prior to uh, getting uh, stoping, uh, we're able to fully develop the underground uh, while the pit's operating. Uh, the low development labor per ton, uh, 2,000 uh, or tons per meter of development, and all of the development really is in, in good rock except for uh, parts of the shaft. So we were able to select our sublevel spacings to align with, with good, good quality rock. A low cap, low opex, sorry, of uh, $10 a ton. And then just control of some of the items that we are concerned about. Groundwater certainly being one of them because we're able to grout the shafts uh, as we go down. And then the um, obviously control of the um, of the ground itself. So going through weaker zones, uh, we're much able to control that. We've got a much shorter distance to travel through some of the uh, thin weak zones that we've got. And then the other thing is the potential to increase production. Um, with relatively uh, no additional development towards the end of the life, which I'll show you in a minute. Next slide. Um, diamond production by talc, this just this, this really um, demonstrates the amount of EMPK, which is the blue line um, as, we're, uh, as we're drawing down. Next slide. This is an isometric view of what the mine design looks like. You can see two shafts, um, a production and ventilation shaft. You can see the outline of the uh, south lobe, the, the uh, aqua color, and then the development from the shafts to the sublevels and 
to the extraction areas at the bottom of the deposit. Next slide. So the long hole shrinkage blasting sequence, um, the idea here is to take roughly 15 to 20 meter um, slices uh, going vertically from the bottom up and really breaking, uh, breaking all of the kimberlite uh, that, that's gonna get, get mined. So as I said, uh, roughly 100 meters apart, sublevel spacing, um, six inch ITH drills. And in the period of time that the stope is being blasted or the pipe is being blasted, um, you can really only muck the swell. So the 7,000 tons a day that is gonna get pulled from the underground, there has to be an equivalent of about uh, 20,000 tons a day being drilled and blasted. So only mucking the swell until the entire pipe is broken. And then it's just simply drawing. There's no more drilling and blasting, no more development. It's simply drawing the broken material down. Um, we assumed about a 30% redrilling factor uh, on our uh, long holes and uh, a four kilogram per ton uh, powder factor. It's interesting to note that the, the size of the drill hole and the powder factor are fairly similar to what the open pit is doing. And we had a lot of questions about how much diamond breakage would we have, you know, drilling these six inch holes, but it's really, it's the equivalent of what the mine is doing right now in the open pit. So at least we had a good uh, direct analog to what we thought uh, might be happening with diamond breakage, which is a very difficult thing to predict, but we thought it, it shouldn't be much different than what is being experienced right now. Next slide. So the mine continues to advance upward. Um, there's the potential to leave a skin of material of, of strong kimberlite material uh, acting as a buffer to some of the weaker zones um, like the carbonaceous shale in order to keep any dilution back um, early on while the, the um, deposits being blasted and then taking that out, out later. Uh, on retreat at the end of the life. Next slide. Uh, and then the crown pillar up into the pit being taken out last uh, prior to the, uh, the extraction of the broken material. Next slide. And then final drawdown. The final drawdown uh, is really gives us an opportunity to um, pull quite a bit faster than when we could, when we were drilling and blasting and going up and could increase the, uh, the throughput into the mill. There would have to be some upgrades on the mill that wasn't planned for in the feasibility study, but it's something that I'm sure will be looked at down the road. Next slide. Um, blasting and mucking schedule. You can see this represents the amount of tons blasted versus the amount of tons mucked, the red bars show how much blasting we have to do in those critical, that critical four year period where we're basically breaking the entire uh, deposit. Next slide. Uh, because we're starting from the bottom up, one of the big trade-off studies was whether we put in declines or shafts. And for the reasons that I mentioned before, the ability to control water and pass through weak lithologies uh, were an important consideration and um, what we think is really de-risking the project to a, a large degree in order to go uh, to get to the bottom uh, with the shafts, with line shafts. The, uh, the schedule was also important and um, putting in the shafts gave us that, um, that ability to meet the, the schedule. So the depletion of the, the pits really needs to fall in line with the startup of the underground. And uh, that's a critical factor in ensuring that there's good um, high, high grade material going to the mill. There's some significant stockpiles on surface of lower value kimberlite, which uh, can fill the gap uh, for uh, about three years. But um, in spite of that, we wanted to make sure that the underground is ready to go roughly when the pit finished. Next slide. With this project obviously comes uh, some with uh, infrastructure, the most important one being uh, electricity supply 
from Botswana Power Corporation. So there'll be a new line run and additional power um, provided to the site. In the meantime, uh, we're running uh, diesel fired uh, temporary gen sets until that line is, is in, which would be next year. Uh, we've got to expand the tailings facilities, water management things. Uh, we've built a construction camp and then everything that goes with that um, potable water, sewage plants, offices, warehouse, shops, that sort of thing. Next slide. Uh, the reserve estimate uh, from uh, year end 2020, you can see is about 54 million tons. That's the bottom line. The underground is uh, 33.4 million tons or 5 million carats, as I mentioned before. Um, what's important is the EMPKS and the MPKS are roughly the same volume of material, but the EMPKS has a significantly higher um, carat count and grade, so it's got approximately double the, the grade um, of the MPKS. Additionally, the EMPKS has, uh, the stones are of higher value, so it's not just about grade, as you know in, in the diamond business, it's about the value and the value of the diamonds are higher. Next slide. Well, the schedule for the project is the uh, shaft engineering, um, starting uh, and the next one down is the precinct. Uh, we're currently on our way with the precinct of the ventilation shaft and the, um, the main shaft, the production shaft will come in shortly uh, in the next few weeks here. Uh, construction camp is commissioned, uh, permanent power becomes available uh, next year, roughly at this time. And then lateral development starts in 2024 with the ramp of the mine, really starting at the beginning of 2026. Next slide. Uh, feasibility, this is from the feasibility study. The total OPEX for the operation is about $28 per ton. And some of the items that were into that, the electrical power costs and uh, diesel costs are <clears throat> shown there. Uh, I won't dwell too much on that. Next slide. Capital costs about 534 million US. The feasibility study was uh, 514. There was about 20 million uh, added to that number for uh, various things, kind of split across uh, a number of the, uh, the components there. The mining part obviously being the predominant one uh, of about 310 million pre-production cost and roughly half of that is the cost to sink the shafts. Next slide. The approach to building the, the mine is really an integrated approach between uh, Lucera and the EPCM contractor, JDS. And um, it's that team, there's about uh, 12 JDS people and about 30 Lucera people. So it's very much integrated uh, and really based on um, capacity and capability of team members. And then there's an oversight advisory team that looks after uh, details, for example, of shaft design, tailings design, that, that sort of thing, water management. So this high level group um, is kind of independent of, the, of any company and just uh, make sure things are going in the right direction. Um, there has been some sole sourcing of contractors, which is um, somewhat unique. Um, we teamed up with UMS, a company uh, in South Africa in order to do the shaft engineering and uh, pre-sync. And um, that uh, has, has worked out well. And um, in general, things are bid, but there, there is an opportunity to sole source for the right group for the right reasons. Most of the work done on site are done by um, uh, Botswana people. Uh, and you can see the hours there split between the, uh, the different groups. Next slide. So in summary, um, the, uh, the underground operation uh, doubles the original feasibility study reserve. It adds about 10 billion in revenue to Lucera Diamonds. Um, about a quarter of a billion uh, in revenue from exceptional diamonds has not been included in the economic analysis. And so there's actually potential for a lot more revenue than we've stated in the feasibility study. 
uh, and that was just to provide a conservative view. So all those 1,300 carat diamonds, the value of those has not been included in our economics. Um, it provides continuous employment for more than 700 people in the country and, and locally, and uh, will contribute uh, an estimated $900 million to uh, the uh, government of Botswana. Uh, that's it. There is a, um, a short video on cutting uh, the Lissetti Lorona diamond, which I think is very interesting. If we have enough time, it, I think it's about uh, four or five minutes. It'd be great to show that far as that if people are, if I have enough time to do that. So this took about um, 18 months to decide how this diamond was going to be cut. And obviously you can see um, how they're approaching it in terms of, you know, maximizing the different shapes and sizes of diamonds they want to break out of it. Um, it's I have absolutely no expertise in this, but it's a interesting view of what the final uh, product is and really what it's all about at the end of the day. So out of that 1100 carat uh, diamond, this was the largest uh, single uh, gemstone that they pulled out in addition to all the rest. That's it. Any questions? This one question raised is, are there gonna be some automation underground? Uh, was it related to automation, did you say? That's correct. Are there, any, are there gonna be any um, automation underground? Yeah, so it's a good point. And it's, it was actually one of the reasons we uh, decided on the method was the ability for electrification completely during drilling, blasting and mucking once the primary development is done. And at that point in time, um, there certainly is the capacity to do automation. In the feasibility study, we didn't do that. We chose, I guess, more conventional at that time uh, route, but there certainly is um, the ability to, to automate. Yeah, the draw points are set up early and in and completely when uh, the actual mining begins. And so the the roots draw points are all well established in advance. So it would be well, well suited to that. Thanks, uh, Gord. Uh, another question raised that, uh, what was the motivation for the sole source in relation to the shaft sinking? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we started out looking for a group to do the engineering on the shaft and UMS had worked with us on the feasibility study. And so they were providing the detailed engineering on that at that time. We really liked the way the group worked. And so as a result of that, we negotiated with them and decided to keep them on for the, the detailed engineering beyond the feasibility study. And again, the relationship was very good. We liked the response, we liked the quality of work. Everything about them was, was going really well. So we ended up uh, bringing them on for the, the precinct. The whole methodology of the shaft sinking and the safety they brought to it was, um, we, we liked. And they were local. So that was the other thing. They're a Johannesburg-based company. Uh, not a great big contractor, 
Um, so they were provide us, able to provide us their undivided attention. We did go out and get a, a reference quote and it ended up being the same as what uh, UMS provided us. So uh, we did provide some reference for the board to make sure that we were doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, the service they provide, the people that were on it and their focus on the project was what were key factors. Thank you very much. The next question is about COVID. What was the impact of COVID on your project? Uh, uh, significant. So we had hoped to be uh, shaft sinking a little bit earlier than we are. Um, there were difficulties getting in and out of uh, Botswana, South Africa, and you know, frankly, I think we all know, you know, leaving leaving our home countries and getting back into our home countries was difficult. So we really took that year, we took last year, 2020, to do all the detailed engineering because all that work could be done remotely. And rather than try and push the schedule too hard uh, on the construction side, because of the problems that we had, we, we'd use that time to do the engineering. And there were a lot of good value engineering uh, work done in that time to, um, to help save money and, and streamline the, the schedule. To this day though, we still, there's uh, COVID in South Africa and Botswana is, is a significant um, issue that is uh, slowly getting better with the rollout of vaccines in the countries. But, you know, it certainly has limited our, our travel to some degree. And um, yeah, as I think everyone's felt the, felt the effects. It hasn't really slowed down the work on site. There, there have been cases on site. They've been managed, isolated. Um, so we haven't had any stoppages. Kuroi's kept on operating the entire time, but it, it's been difficult. Okay. Let's go to one more question. Is there any risk to the upper levels being drilled due to the underlying caving? Uh, absolutely. And that was a, that was a very big um, concern that we looked at. And so we did a lot of modeling. We had all of this massive amount of geotechnical data. So we worked with Atasca to do modeling of the the stope basically of the pipe as we're doing that. That's why we came up with the shape that we did, kind of a dome shape to the stope. And that shape will be maintained uh, through the life. With that shape, there's a couple things that come into the, uh, the competency of the, of the material and the ability to work above it. There's the, um, first of all, the shape, the, the circular shape of it is a confining shape. Um, it's not big in size. So again, think back to the convention center um, and, and then the, just, just the quality of rock. Now, having said that, as we start this, we'll be monitoring the, the shape of the stope all the way up very closely, continuously. And if for some reason it decides to cave, if, if something happens that's totally unexpected, the entire mine is set up with the extraction area and the draw points set up like a cave. So if we find that um, we don't need to drill and blast anymore and it's gonna cave on its own, the mine is set up to do that and we'll just carry on without that, without the drilling and blasting. But it's a, it's a really good question and it's a, it's a significant consideration. Thanks, uh, I guess we have one more question. How the blasted rock is handled? How is uh, the rock is being from mine to mill perspective? Uh, sorry, I missed the I missed that. But the question is how the blasted rock is is handled. I guess maybe the question is referring how the the blasted rock is being uh, brought to the surface. Oh, how the rock is being brought to the surface? That's correct. Yeah, so uh, from the extraction level, it goes to a crusher, underground crusher at the edge of the extraction level, it's conveyed to the loading pockets and uh, conveyed up the shaft in 21 ton skips. Okay, and one more question is, what's the reclamation plan uh, after operation is complete? Yeah, so the reclamation plan is really, uh, just in line with what uh, Kuroi has planned previously, there's the uh, tailings area will be slightly larger, but the impact of the underground is, is, is tiny uh, in the overall scheme of things. So 
the reclamation plan related to the underground is really not much of a change from their, their current one. So it's the same thing that you see um, often. It's uh, re resloping waste piles. It's um, uh, topsoil uh, cover, um, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I don't believe we have any more questions. I'd like to thank you, Gord, for, for a very amazing presentation on, on behalf of uh, CIM. I'd like to thank you for that. All right, I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. The next one, thank you. Thanks, Sherman.